Welcome everyone. My name is Andrew Hunt. On behalf of the Bovine and D Laval, I am the moderator of today's presentation. Uh, we're excited to have you with us. So it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Lizzie is a member of the uh, Dairy Management Advisory Automatic Milking Systems team, uh, the North American team at D Laval. Uh, she does hail from Illinois, but uh, I'm sure travels quite a bit and she'll tell us kind of what she does when she's not uh, wearing blue, I think in a few moments, but it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Lizzie to, a, to everyone today and uh, we're excited to get going. Lizzie. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you all for taking the time today to join me and for those that log in later to record, thank you for taking the time to listen to the recording. Uh, so as Andrew mentioned, I am currently a dairy management advisor, one of the dairy management advisors within D. Laval for the North American uh, team. Uh, my background is a lot in nutrition. A lot of my schooling has been in nutrition, but uh, currently, when I'm not uh, out on the road advising for robotic dairies, a lot of what I'm doing is either playing the banjo, traveling around Wisconsin with my Huskies, and just exploring the great outdoors. So, again, but a lot of my passion lies here with the robotic world and um, assisting customers both in the planning of robotic uh, dairying as well as the follow-up after. And kind of seeing where those opportunities lie to, lie to continue to improve management. And so today what I'm going to be talking about is first a little bit of why robotics in the first place. Why are we talking robotics? And the interest that uh, potential customers have in seeking the path towards a robotic farming. And then from there, move into what are some of the other topics that we need to consider when planning for a robotic facility? So both looking at the cow traffic scenarios and figuring out what works best into your management scheme, as well as forming that team of influentials and advisors that work directly on the farm and plan, 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 and plan not only before the robotic, uh, robotic milking, but after as well. That's just as critical. And again, optimizing productivity and efficiency within our, uh, the robotic system. And so that will lead me into the next part of the talk about as far as after starting with robotics, finding those routines. And then just a few conclusions from uh, today's talk. So again, the question comes into why move into the robotic milking world in the first place? Well, definitely the most common answers that I see and that a lot of my colleagues see is lifestyle. Um, which, of course, is closely linked to labor when we think of that we're aiming for less labor, we want more consistent labor, we want to have less hired labor, or maybe it's a combination of both. Uh, definitely something that comes up is that next generation of milking and the next generation of farmers and having the opportunity for those children to come back to the farm and participate in the uh, on the operation within the family. And so robotics are a way to keep... Um, individuals more interested in staying and daring. And of course, this ties back into labor. But then some of the other common answers that do come up are, we want more milk. And we'll get into some talks or some topics a little bit later on as far as, is it current management that has opportunity? Or do we need to look for planning a new facility that would provide even greater opportunities for management and cow productivity, welfare, um, et cetera? So again, these are some of the most common answers that we have of why thinking about robotic milking in the first place. But then, of course, comes how does the robot achieve these objectives? Uh, well, definitely we're milking 24-7, keeping in mind our routine cleanings of three times a day and some idle time and other time deviations we'll get into. But that's the overall concept is that we're milking 24-7. We're able to uh, have more milkings per day and ideally have more production overall. We're also improving labor efficiency where now we have one person to manage 50 to 180 cows. More up on the level of 100 cows, I would say, but definitely on some of the larger farms, they're really trying to push those numbers of cows and get up towards closer to that 180. But definitely more milk in the sense that if cows can be milked more often, if we were at a 2x milking and now we're able to get 3x milking with the focus on that first 100 days of milk, then we can really start pushing production and see some of that um, opportunity there. But of course, we have to remember that the cows have to come on their own. So when we're thinking of it in this way, we have to ensure that we have the most optimal cow welfare, cow comfort, and that all of our management, uh, various management areas are 
in order so we can make sure that we're providing everything that she needs. And so again, just as, just looking at a list of when we're talking about robotics, what are some of the customizable options that we have? I mean, of course we can have customized consistent milkings, tea cleaning requirements that fit uh, not only the average cow in the herd, but some that may need more specific cleaning that focuses on you know animals that might be a little bit less hygienic, for instance. Uh, having the ability for individual quarter monitoring and detaching, so each quarter treating it as an individual with different flows, and again, optimizing that production. Automatic cleaning between milkings, uh, whether or not we're treating animals or just routine cleanings as a whole. And of course, system alerts. What's going on with the robot? Is there anything from the technical side that does have an opportunity? Are there any animals that are struggling to actually adapt to the machine that we need to pay closer attention to? And that leads into the side of herd management of what the robotic uh, milking can realistically offer. Now we're getting streams and streams of data from these robots on the cows, whether or not we're correlating those milk weights, we're monitoring certain parameters concerning utter health. That could be somatic cell count, conductivity, lactate dehydrogenase, uh, as well as general productivity. And then different things within feeding. Now we have inline milk samples that can analyze beta-hydroxybutyrate, look at urea, not only on the bulk tank level, but within groups of animals and different lactations and stages of lactation. Of course, there are tools for rumination, tools for looking at intake, tracing those animals historically, looking at different reproductive functions, whether or not we're looking at milk progesterone, we're looking at the animal's activity, if we're using different uh, reproduction programs, and then being able to remotely log in and uh, see what's going on. And in the reality, this can work in a variety of different scenarios. So we don't only have small to medium dairy seeking robotics for all the offer, uh, benefits that it can bring, but we also have larger dairies spanning uh, upwards of eight robots over 40 robots. And so it ranges across all different scenarios, um, all different goals and herd sizes as a whole. And of course, you can't forget that we also have the capability of looking at grazing dairies for automatic milking systems and um, meeting those management needs. But at the end of the day, no matter what the size of the robot, no matter how much information we can gather from these automatic milking systems and then herd management, it's all about the cows. And it's all about ensuring that they're in the best standing possible to be able to get up and get milked when they want to, to be able to receive feed when they want to, water, lay down and find a clean bed. And of course, within each of those management areas, we'll get into some of the specifics of it. But at the end of the day, it's all about the cows and making sure that they're in the best standing possible. And so when we think about what the robot uh, cannot do, of course it can't regularly maintain itself. And so a certain amount of service is required, cleanings and routine um, uh, main maintenance of the robot as a whole. It can't necessarily maintain and promote healthy cows that can produce milk. That comes back to a lot of the management. Uh, we need to be able to have a design or make the barn in a design where one person can do more on their own. The robot won't do that for us. And that we always want to have a goal of 10% lameness until so the cow can get to the robot when they do want to. And of course, keeping the cow cleans in any, clean in any system and making sure that we have the most hygienic animals approaching the robot, that they're being cleaned effectively in the robot so we have a sanitary, clean teeth to attach that milker to and uh, collect the most uh, wholesome quality product possible. And so at the end of the day, the robot can do a lot of things and point to a lot of health indicators within these cows, but it can't maintain itself and it cannot manage the herd. And at the end of the day, managing the herd does fall back on us and making sure that they're in the best uh, possible standing. And so that leads into the next topic, which is what are some of the topics that we need to consider as far as planning robotic facility? And looking at different cow traffic scenarios and figuring out um, what are some opportunities that may suit our needs? But of course, when we're looking at starting robotics, we have to look at are we having a retrofit design or a new barn? And if we are deciding to retrofit a barn, we have to remember what is the decision to keep it? Uh, and is there anything that we need to uh, adjust within the current facility to make it more optimal for robots? And most of the 
time, yes, we definitely do need to do some of that. But within the retrofit, it's great if we this barn is to be able to reach our productivity goals in some sense. But there probably are some improvements as far as looking towards robotics. But then there's always the option of a new barn. And but when we're planning a new barn, we need to keep in mind that those goals for lifestyle or labor and milk production and making sure that we're having the barn fit our needs and make us want to be in that barn and that it definitely ensures clean, healthy cows and that where you can work in an efficient manner and be on top of your management game. And again, just a few more topics when we think about looking at retrofits. Is it a situation where we're, all that we're missing in this our current management is fresh cow management and making sure that we're getting more milkings for that first third of lactation? Or within the new barn, how will it be different than what you're doing now? Is it a matter that the facility is outdated and might have smaller stalls, that the bedding is less than optimal for cow comfort, uh, or that it's just a, a darker facility and we need more feed space, air, light, et cetera, just to continue improving that cow comfort? And for instance, those special need cows, do we, have, do we need more room to be able to actually take care of them? And then if we are uh, struggling with a transition cow program, have we identified what the opportunity is and what improvements we need to make? And if we are building a new facility, how will that all fit in? And how will we make sure that it's different than what we were doing previously? And definitely there are already, when we're talking about barn designs, whether it's retrofit or new barn, there are a variety of cow traffic systems that have already been proven. Whether or not it's free flow, where again, the cow has opportunity to go uh, make the choice as far as going to the robot or the feed bunk itself or go, go lay down versus more of a guided scenario where the cows are moving in one direction and in this, in whether or not it's feed first or milk first or free flow for that matter, feed is always going to be the driver to get the cows to the robot. So in free flow, when we're uh, having the cows making that choice to go to the robot more simply, we need to rely more on feed from that robot. And we'll get into more of the nutrition scenarios later. But versus in guided, if we're in a feed first scenario, the cows pass through the feed bunk first, pass through the feed bunk uh, first to receive the bulk of their forage ration before going to the robot and then going to lay back down. And in milk first is just the opposite where now the cows are starting in the free stalls, and in either guided scenario, they have a um, pre-milking selection gate, so if that cow does have milking permission to, uh, to be able to go to the robot, she would enter into a holding area and be milked, and then at the end, go over to the feed bunk. Again, on the feed first side, that cow would be, if she had milking permission, after going to the feed bunk first, she would be milked, and then go back to the free stalls. So there are many different cow traffic systems, and they do vary as far as complexity with the sense that in Guida now we're having gates that are directing cows in one direction, but we also have to look at the other side of capacity and some of the limitations with any cow traffic scenario. And again, we'll get into that as we go through starting out with the time budget of a dairy cow. And so when we look at how much a cow actually spends in the alley time milking standing in the stall, feeding, uh, et cetera, we can see that 60% of the time that cow is spent in the free stall itself, whether or not it's lying, feeding, or just standing in the stall, hopefully minimally. Otherwise, you might have a situation of lameness. But still, the cow is spending a lot of time there. And so when we're looking at, again, the design of the barn as a whole, we always have to keep in mind that the robotic herds that achieve the greatest level of production, they have these ducks in a row as far as plenty of eating space, drinking space, walking space, resting, all the above, and plenty of air and light. And again, when we think about submissive cows, I put a note in here, is that being able to have that accessibility and see where they're moving to avoid maybe some of the more dominant cows, but have that opportunity when they want to eat, get up to the bunk and get there, this all comes into play. And so again, the pillars of cow comfort and that they all fit together and enter into the equation to reach greater levels of production. And so no matter which cow traffic scenario you have, all of these need to be in order. And when we look at a barn design here, looking at barn A versus barn B, 
you can have a guess of which one would probably have the more efficient milk production. And maybe where there's some opportunity to improve that stall length, to widen those alleys and uh, improve cow flow overall. And definitely when we're talking about the keys to management success, that ties into cows being able to lay down when they want to, eat when they want to, and have access to the milk, milking machine when they want to. Because definitely within the AMS farm, the cows that are able to rest, get up, and move around have them a lot better production as, as long as they're sound on their feet and uh, also have other health, um, health management in a row. But it's very critical when we think about cow comfort and all uh, cow traffic scenarios. But the next part of, about it when we think about cow traffic is labor efficiency. And there definitely is some difference within labor efficiency between the two, uh, whether or not it's guided or free. And typically when we look at free cow traffic, our fetch rate are those cows that are overdue for milking, mostly uh, in the 12, over 12 hours since their last milking. Uh, we don't have to fetch as many in, uh, excuse me, within the free traffic, we're end up actually fetching more. But we have to think of the fact that now we don't have pre-milking selection gates that are sorting cows that may not have milking permission. So within our free traffic, we end up getting upwards of 16% as far as fetch cows or bringing cows that are overdue for milking compared to guided or run closer of an upper limit of 10% of cows that might need to be fetched. Again, ideally that milking intervals are within 12 hours. But as we get into looking at some of this data that we're collecting from the robot and making decisions, we'll see that those first 100 days in milk are a lot of where we get that production from and can really uh, um, get cows uh, taking off and in the best situation possible. So again, when we talk about labor efficiency, there are a few differences. We'll be expecting to fetch more cows with free traffic versus guided traffic. But when we think about robot capacity as a whole, and you're um, independent, I would say, of uh, cow traffic, it's always multivariable. And now when we're talking robotics, we need to remember that we're defining capacity within three areas, whether or not it's the cow capacity of the robot, the feeding, and then the system efficiency overall. Starting off first with the system efficiency, on barns that are at the highest level of capacity, normally that upper limit ends up being about 88% of the total 24 hours in a day is spent towards milking, which ends up equating to around 21 milking, um, milking hours a day. Now we have to keep in mind that although we might have 1,200 milking minutes a day, we'll have upwards of 10% refusals. So again, when we're looking at free cow traffic scenario, when that uh, cow has free range as far as getting over to the robot or the feed bunk, that we will have some refusals, or meaning that cows will come to the robot that do not have milking permission. And so again, within the guided systems, this does not occur because the pre-selection gate, if the cow did not have permission, she would go either to the feed bunk if it was a milk first, or back to the stalls if it was a feed first. But when we're talking about in this particular scenario, as far as system capacity, we will have a level of refusals uh, within a free traffic scenario. And that does equate to some time taken up for the total hours that we can milk. So once we remove that, we end up with around 1,134 minutes a day that we could milk these cows. And if the average animal is able to be completely milked in seven minutes, then we would be allowed to have 162 milkings per day. And now when we actually look at the system capacity as a whole, with number of cows, we have to remember that as we either increase or decrease the number of cows, we have more opportunities for more milkings. So in this particular example with a seven minute of milking time, if we had 60 cows, we'd be able to provide or have an average of 2.7 milkings a day, as opposed to if we are only at 50 cows, we'd be closer to 3.2 milkings a day that we would have the ability uh, to get in that 24-hour period. But again, we always have to remember, I mean, we have to accept the pros and cons of any scenario, uh, keeping in mind that we know we will have some refusals 
and that means less potential cows milking uh, milkings and milk overall. But as long as we're within that 30 to 40 minutes uh, per AMS per day, then we're in good standing, and we're not taking up too much time to uh, for cows that don't have milking permission. And if cows are coming too much to the robot, then that means that we have some opportunity in the feeding side of things. But of course, when we're talking about uh, minimizing refusals, the idea with uh, pre-selection and the guided scenario, cow traffic scenario is that you have no refusals because you have the gate that's pre-selecting those animals. But now when we're thinking about feeding and cow efficiency, we're kind of dealing with some different topics. And what I have presented here is research from the University of, uh, or excuse me, Michigan State University that was looking at different feeding scenarios, whether or not they are on a full TMR and providing minimal amounts of pellets through the robot, more a partial TMR, so again, increasing the total amount that would be fed through the robot, so getting closer to that 15% dry matter or above, or if we're doing more of a pasture-based concentrate scenario. And what this particular slide demonstrates is that if you look across the time of milking versus the actual milk per milking, it's evident, evident that when we're feeding more of a closer to a TMR style, at least within this particular study, that we're actually able to obtain greater milk per cow per day. So in this TMR scenario, we're collecting closer to 36 kilograms uh, per cow per day and decrease. But of course, this all goes back to the feeds that we're providing, where is the digestibility. But in general, in this particular study, this is what they found, that we were able to collect more milk in a shorter amount of time when we're sticking closer to more of a TMR-based uh, scenario. And when we look at now the cow efficiency and number of cows we can actually milk, in this particular study, it was found that cows were actually milking a little bit faster in the TMR versus partial, T, partial TMR or pasture concentrate scenario. And when they're milking a little bit faster, we can get more cows through that way. But also, if we're not producing as much, we're probably not taking as much time to be milked. And now when we actually look across in the different feeding scenarios and the number of cows we can actually milk, we see that in the situation where we're not producing as much, we could actually be getting closer to 83 cows two times a day through for milking versus in another scenario where we're reaching higher levels of production. Hopefully we have faster milking times and we're able to get closer to an average of three time a day milking. So there are definitely some differences in feeding and uh, cow efficiency as well as system efficiency overall. But when we, ever we talk about uh, increasing production, we always go back to milking interval, and then we really want to make sure those cows are coming within every 12 hours. Because as evident on this slide, when we look at the percent of yield increase versus milking hour interval hours, as we approach 14 hours and above, the average yield actually decreases. And Swedish research has found from a uh, university over there that actually we're seeing an increase in somatic cell counts as well as we get above that 12 hours. So as animals actually moved from 12 to 16 hour milking intervals, they saw a double in somatic cell counts in some cases. So not only does it have an implication as far as milk yield overall, but also utter health as a whole and making sure that we're not causing undue pressure on a particular or on that cow and also causing her um, to have another health implications that she needs to be uh, fighting for, I guess. But so again, when we're talking about capacity, milking intervals are huge and that definitely milking interval comes into play when we're talking about mastitis. In general, again, I would say both guided and free traffic do keep milking intervals regular. Uh, in some ways, the pre-selection has a way of um, keeping them more regular just because it's pre-selecting those cows. But in any situation, having your management strategies perform at 100% is key across all traffic scenarios. And as long as your routines are consistent, that your cow flow will be consistent and milking intervals should not be an issue. So again, I'd say that both of these points can really apply to any cow traffic scenario. 
And at the end of the day, as I've mentioned, is that vetting and general cow management are critical across any scenario, whether or not we're talking about conventional versus robotic milking. It's always important. But that's just a little bit as far as looking at some of the capacity and just in general some of the differences that we do see when we're looking at uh, guided versus free traffic and some of the differences there. But when we talk about uh, planning a robotic facility as a whole, we also remember need to remember that we have a team that's getting involved. And having uh, the advisors and influentials at our farm working with us so we make sure that everyone has the training that they need and that we're providing the best guidance possible and really seeing what's going on with the herd and making improvements. And so over the next few slides, I'm going to go through some of the topics that definitely get brought up with before we even start uh, making the sale with robotics, but also then when the sale is made and we're planning that uh, robotic facility, what are the things that we're meeting about to make sure that are in a row? And so starting first with milk quality considerations. With any area of management, of course, we need to have a plan or standard operating procedure in place. And in the case with uh, animal health, hopefully we have a prevention plan overall that we're not constantly treating and curing, that we're preventing infections from happening. And so, but in a way to make sure that we are preventing and seeing that our prevention is working properly, how are we monitoring that? And then if we are having certain outbreaks, how are we controlling that? So first, starting with milk quality. Again, when we look at this, we have to remember that we're taking a holistic approach. And as you'll look, this applies to conventional just as it does robotics. But with slight differences, we have, of course, the, the cow's environment as a whole. What is she eating? What is our herd management? What is the information that we're collecting to make decisions on utter health? The robot as a whole are we cleaning and maintaining and making sure that it's in its cleanest form, that we're performing the three-time-a-day cleaning, that we're making sure that the robot's not sitting too idle, and that or idle meaning that no cows are coming through, that we could have uh, growth uh, occurring, that we're cooling our milk properly, of course, and again, cleaning. And so when we're talking about milk quality considerations, it's the same thing that... Uh, we've seen time and time again, we have to prevent entrance and prevent growth. Prevent entrance, of course, being the fewer bacteria that enter the system, the better overall. And so when we talk about that individualized uh, teat cleaning and just pre-milking disinfection of the teats, as well as cleaning the teats prior to milking and then post-milking disinfection, those all aid in preventing entrance and also then disinfecting that animal. But then, of course, we have udder singeing. We need to ensure that the robot can effectively attach, that we don't have too much udder hair that would now be collecting any sort of debris that could um, impact the robot from identifying teats and attaching effectively. And then it goes back to udder confirmation. Or do we have teats that are extremely cross that might prevent difficulty for the robot to actually attach? Uh, do we have really small teats? Do we have teats that are on the side? So utter confirmation when we're thinking about efficiency as far as attachment and milk out, these are things that need to be taken into account and really evaluate, is this cow going to make it in a robotic herd? But that's just dealing with some of the entrants. We also have to prevent growth, of course, which comes with proper water temperatures and chemical dosing when we're talking about uh, cleaning the system, meaning proper water, uh, hot enough water, that we've done our water test, we know what's going on inside, that we're dosing the right chemicals at the right amount. And then as I alluded to in the previous slide, cleaning up, we have too much idle time. So again, when we look at the bacterial exponential growth of uh, microbes, that if we have a system sitting idle for more than 25 minutes even, a local sanitizing should probably be put in place. Just because... Now we have milk sitting there, so when the next cow comes in, if there's been bacteria growing, that's what's going to get pumped over to the tank. So we always have to think that the preventative side of things, that we want to um, keep everything clean from the start, and so then we won't have to try to identify if there's a problem later. And so regular cleaning, of course. If there's no parents, there's no offspring. And if there's no food, there's no growth. 
and of course cooling. So these are some of the things that get brought up when we're talking about uh, looking at milk quality. And of course setting targets. And when we talk about anything with robotics in, in the later slides, data management is huge. Setting your goals, following those goals, making sure that you're getting the number of milkings, that your cows are milking effectively, that your harvest rate is as such. So looking at some of this information that um, each robot will pre present in some form or another and having an idea of how the cows are performing and monitoring it. Now that was just a little bit into milk quality. Of course, there's the whole aspect of mastitis programs and making sure we know what's coming into the system that we're treating for the right pathogens. But just to give you a little introduction into that side of how we start planning. But of course, feeding is huge. Feeding is one of the most critical parts when we think about robotic milking. And we consider the fact that uh, feed is the main driver to a robotic system in some capacity or another, no matter what cow traffic scenario, it's a huge uh, important factor to consider. And that we need to make sure that we're delivering feed. Fresh feed has not only pushing up feed on a regular basis, but delivery of fresh, fresh feed multiple times a day. Because research definitely shows that while pushing up feed does drive cows, fresh feed delivery definitely encourages more intake, greater room and pH consistency, greater milk fat overall, just because, again, we're supporting th that cow and her rumen microbes, which at the end of the day convert all this feed over to milk. And so not only delivery of feed, again, push up, but space. If a cow needs to be able to get to the feed bunk and wants to eat, she should have that opportunity to do so. And when we're talking about feeding in robots, of course we have multiple realities, whether we're doing a main forage base at the bunk and providing all of our concentrates either through um, some through the robot through some feeding stations, if we're doing more of that partial mixed ration where we're providing now um, more some concentrate through the bunk itself as well as through the robot in a pelletized form, or if we're feeding uh, more of a one-group TMR scenario where we're minimizing the amount that's actually going through the robot. So there's many different ways that we can feed in these scenarios. But pellets are always critical. And of course, there are debates of whether or not we can feed some whole feeds versus pelletized feeds. But at the end of the day, as we start increasing the amount of feed that that cow needs to get through the robot because it's part of her ration, we need to make sure it's as balanced as possible. And quite frankly, whole feeds just don't have that drive, that palatability, that smell that will get uh, turns in some ways. And so when we, of course, make sure she likes it that it's fresh less than 30 days, because when we're talking about different flavorings and things, normally within 30 days, they're not as fresh anymore. And you'll start, to, in, some, in some farms, it's amazing about how turns will increase just when the fresh feed is delivered, because if they had um, too much supply, that it just was getting stale after a while. And of course, in addition to freshness, that it's hardness, that it's consistently being dispensed every time. It's free of fines, because when we look at the animal being able to consume that feed in the time that she's being milked, if there's an excessive amount of fines, cows just can't consume that as, as fast as they can a good hard pellet. But when we're talking about increasing um, the pellet consumption through the robot, then we always have to go back to what are the ingredients being provided? Are they rumen safe? Is it uh, you know supplementing her ration or is it just a bunch of garbage that's being added to a pellet that doesn't necessarily need to be in there. So of course, working with individuals that know cows, that know ruminants, have good quality feed that they can add to a pellet that will cause that animal to be driven uh, to be milked. And so uh, this is a lot of what we talk about. And again, you know, making sure that in the first place that we have a good pellet that will be consistently delivered is, is very crucial. Because again, pellets will be fed in some form. And this chart is used to demonstrate in, in a general in general rule of thumb how we end up feeding cows within various uh, traffic systems. Now, as we start increasing the amount of feed that we're providing through the robot, so getting closer to uh, that average of four to six uh, kg per day, we're moving much more towards a free flow feed first scenario. But there are some farms that do choose to feed more through the robot and a guided milk first scenario for sure. 
But we find that as we drop down to less than 15% of the diet dry matter, that it just becomes a little bit more challenging to have that same sort of drive to the robot. So again, it ends up being looking more like a one-group TMR. And so the pellet smell and taste and everything is just as important, even if we're feeding less of it. But again, we're just not providing as much, and so some of the ingredients can change as well. That as we start feeding more, of course, we can't just feed a very highly soluble uh, energy feed, that we need to balance it out with some of the other things like proteins from that standpoint. And in general, when we're talking pellets, minimizing the fat and minimizing, minimizing the mineral uh, is the way to go, just from the sense of palatability, dispensing, and everything. That's all important from that standpoint. And when, then when we talk about actually consumption and thinking towards nutrition and robotics, we also have to think that after the fact, how we like to break up the cows. And so looking at what percent of the herd is in days in milk, 1 to 100, 101 to 200, and greater than 200 days in milk. Because again, those first uh, 30 days and the first 100 days in milk, that's where we're trying to get those animals upwards above three milkings a day because they're taking off out of the gates. As long as they've had a good transition, they're ready to go, producing a lot, have the drive to intake a lot of feed. And again, or, uh, these are the cows that make farming enjoyable because they're motivated, they're doing well, they're producing a lot. And these are the cows that you want to allow greater opportunity to go to the robot. Because, and when we talk about days in milk of looking close to that 160 days that we're uh, trying to reach, that's also very important um, when we're talking about how are these animals performing and splitting them up within days in milk to make sure we're reaching our goals. And so I just point out, of course, transition period. This is where we're looking to, you know, reach that peak milk. But we know that we do have inner dry matter intake lagging behind milk. And so we, what we want to do is minimize that mobilizing of fat and ketosis that could occur, drive that intake, and have the cow reach her peaks. But if she is struggling in that transition period, it could result in a detrimental effect in reproduction, of course. And re being reproduction being one of the top three largest costs, that's extremely important. And that if we have decreased pregnancy rate and increased number of days open, we're just going to reduce our farm profitability overall. And so this goes into the next part of when we're planning for a robotic milking that is extremely important to have our reproductive team as well, which includes the vet in some cases, in most cases, the genetics company if one's being used, and the dealership herd management support, which why you might say technician herd management support at the dealership. Well, look at the tools that are being applied are using activity, synchronization programs, maybe a combination of synchronization activity, or um, of course, herd navigator looking at inline milk sampling and actually evaluating more of the milk progesterone. But with any of these technologies that companies offer, there is a level of technical ability that's required to make sure that they're functioning properly and that you're getting the data that you're getting is useful to you to make management decisions. So no matter what technologies you have in place, Again, there is, it is a team approach in making sure you're identifying the cows that you want to breed and focus on while at the same time that the equipment is functioning properly. And so, of course, we still have our goals when we're talking about reproduction as a whole. And lameness. Of course, nutrition, reproduction, milk quality are all extremely important, but as I said at the beginning of the talk, the cows need to have the drive to get to the robot and go on their own. And so lameness is always a huge factor. That Do we have a foot bath routine in place? Are we keeping the stalls clean? Doing the alleyways clean? And as we move towards larger herds, more confined animals overcrowding, lameness definitely inc increases. And when we look at upwards of 40% of the animals on herds might be lame, that's a huge issue. And when we're talking robotics, that's an even bigger issue because we're not, you know, bringing them to the to the parlor two, three times a day now where, you know, they're, they're coming no matter what, but we also need to look towards that in robotics again. They're going to be coming on their own, so they need to be motivated and sound on their feet. So 
lameness is important, and when we're talking about the day allocation for those cows, that we looking at animal standing, we definitely see increases in standing in stalls as animals become more lame, less time resting and eating. So again, productivity overall decreasing. And if we can get that one kilogram more um, more per milk um, as the animal lays over 10 hours, then let's try to do that. And so these are cows that will come up whether you're in robotics or not. But of course, is this cow lame? And what are you what are you going to do with her? And especially in the robotics, how are you going to make sure that she's in a special area that can be treated uh, well? And what are we doing more importantly to prevent these animals um, from coming in? So the last part um, of the talk will be a little bit more on after the start, finding those routines and making sure that you have a plan in place to continue to move forward, move forward towards reaching your productivity uh, goals. And so this comes around with farm routines, hygiene, of course, regular service on the robot that's uh, required for any robotic system, proper management using the data to your ability, and again, just making sure that we're developing our own routines. And before even starting with robotics, making sure that the dealership, the veterinarian, the nutritionist, the genetic, everyone in the team that we're focusing on those key management areas, that we're training on the software that we're now going to be implementing to start receiving information on these cows. So everyone can continue improving their respective management areas, but know where to find this information. So again, a couple months, and again, one month leading up before starting up robotics, that we make sure that we're talking about things such as water quality, milk quality, et cetera, all sorts of things um, in regards to just what we laid out as far as management. But then after the startup, of course, now we're getting information from the system. So what do we do with that information? So learning the software more and more as we start implementing it into our own management practices and moving forward and learning as we go. Because at the end of the day, we're going to have data management. It's all, again, all about the cow. So whether or not we have general info on this cow, events that happen in her life, and then we'll also be collecting different information on her milk feed and the whole circle of the cow's life as a whole. And so not to give a list of routines, but of course, when we think robotics, why are we going to be spending more time or maybe the same time after robotics? Well, there's going to be definitely maintenance on that robot that needs to be taken care of, those fetch cows, those overdue cows, making sure all animals are being fed. I'm talking about lactating cows, but let's not forget the calves and heifers, of course, which are the future of our lactating herd. And then regular routine that we'd be doing in any scenario, of course, that are critical, whether cleaning and regular maintenance overall. And as it says on the bottom here, record keeping, analysis of records. We have a lot more data coming in. And so where do we start? Well, first place to start is learning to record this data if you haven't already been doing so and working with your data management system to start entering in different heats, artificial insemination, all the things that happen with this cow. Because the more quality information you add into the system, the more it can help you with your management decision. But if you're not putting in accurate information, then it's going to be difficult to accurately find animals when you need to, whether or not it's for repro or feeding, et cetera. But within robotics, there is a level of data entry, and this is something that might have been going on before, but analyzing that data and, of course, continuing with the support of your team because Robots don't replace uh, that side of things, that it's always important to have the team in place to be able to make that those management decisions. But what's exciting about robotics, of course, is that now we have these different uh, abilities to actually connect in and see what alerts are going on with our cows and remote and not only from the producer standpoint, but the advisors as well, so they can log in and make sure that animals are performing to the best of their ability that... Um, we know what's going on and can make better decisions for that customer. And so as you can see, there's a, a lot going in, but you know, while a lot changes, a lot stays the same. And that at the end of the day, you want to have a barn that you can work in and want to work in. 
and be able to meet that goal of moving the number of animals, whether it's 50 to 100 or above, with one to two people, and that your time budgets are able to fit into your management routines and meet your family needs, of course. But it's all about the cows, and we want to provide that good bedding, that soft cushioning that they can get up and down when they need to, and that we're providing those treatments on time, whether or not it's for hoof disease, if it's an other health issue, um, that we can provide those special needs cows the attention that they need. And of course, um, on, on a timely manner, and identify these animals. And just to, again, follow up with some conclusions that, of course, well-maintained robots will milk cows. And it's a matter of maintaining them so they're functioning to the best of their ability. But Technology will aid in detecting heats, detecting sick cows, and of course, if you're using it and understand the system, have the proper training and have everyone on board, it can really help improve things and just continue to improve yourselves as a better manager of these animals. And so really, it's the attention to detail and using the system to the best of its capacity, entering in the information that you find most useful to make management decisions so you can just continue to achieve a greater level of milk production. But having the team in place so everyone's in the know is always important. And of course, at the end of the day, we have all this technology. It's wonderful. But let's not distract it from being the best um, cow person that we know we can be. And uh, I'd like to conclude uh, officially with today's webinar with the quote that automatic does not mean that the role of competent staff would in any way be diminished. I think that's always something important to think about. And again, I appreciate your time, and I'd like to entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you. Great, Lizzie. We appreciate that a lot. I'm just going to snag back control. And we will put up some questions, and I'll share my screen. Uh, we've had quite a few questions come in. I have been uh, paraphrasing a few of them, but I will start to work through. So some of the questions were kind of similar. So I have uh, put them together to kind of in the respective time and efficiency that uh, maybe we can answer both uh, in there. Uh, one of the first questions that came in is, what is the biggest challenge most producers face when transitioning to robotics? Is it labor issues or uh, layout issues or what factors do you find is the most limiting? That's an excellent question. Well, I would say one of the greatest opportunities, I mean, layout-wise when you're transitioning, you should have a team in place that's going to give you the honest answers as far as do we have enough space in front of the robot, are our stalls proper, all the management areas I talked about. I think one of the greatest challenges would definitely be if you've never had a computer before, now you're having a computer software program that's giving you a bunch of you know, numbers and information about your cows, but that just comes with training. So if you're working with a competent dealership and herd management individuals, and also, again, that you have, I, I mean, I really say the team meetings to support and learn the software, then you're going to be in good shape. Um, so th that definitely, I would say, that learning the software can be a little bit of a challenge, but once you have the training and work through it, it, it ends up being just fine. But then after starting up, I'd say just, Finding those routines and, again, finding that consistency after the fact that now you're not bringing cows two, three times a day to be milked, so how are you reorganizing your day? But um, at the end of it, I, so that's what I'd say, is like the software side and just kind of working one into their own routines. Okay. Another great answer. Thank you. Another question comes in is, I understand that it's hard to train mature cows to use a robotic system. Is that true or is it something else? They're just wondering if maybe older cows are trained onto robotic systems. Well, I would say that definitely when you start with robotics, it's worthwhile evaluating which of the cows that are getting close to drying off, so I'd say within 60 days. And those cows in general, I mean, they're just getting a little bit lower in milk production, getting a little bit lazier. They just have a hard time adapting because the motivation is just not there. So one of the recommendations that gets made is that, you know, if there are some cows that are a little bit lower in production, you could dry off sooner. You might take the opportunity to do that just because 
they will be a little bit more sluggish. But really, I think that the, the mature cows adapt really well. And as long as you have good people working with the cows that are very calm, that it, it's normally not a problem whatsoever, and they take off really well. I think one of the bigger opportunities is with the heifers and, again, making sure it's as pleasant of an experience for them the first time they're being milked and having people who can be very calm with them because, it, of course, we're dealing with animal handling and we want the most positive experience in the robot possible. But with that in mind, just to quickly wrap up this question is that um, any opportunity you have to do any sort of pre-training, what I mean by pre-training as far as if you can run cows with the robot, if it's in a retrofit or top dress pellet, so when they get into a new facility, they recognize the smell in the robot, any of those cues to, again, that something that's a little bit more familiar or experienced, that can always help out in that way. Okay, great. Um, another question comes in. What are the factors that most producers miss when they transition to robots that you find that maybe they didn't fully think through? That's a great question. Well, in some ways, I what I've started to see is, um, d depending on the scenario, that sometimes when we're now we're relying on more of these technologies to pick up, uh, I guess, for instance, I'll use activity as a scenario. So, for instance, if you're using a complete synchronization program before, and now you're switching completely to activity, if you didn't have the heat detection skills from the get-go, and now you are trying to rely on something something that is best used alongside with some you know, heat detection, for, for, for an example, uh, that will definitely be challenging. So, you know, it's picking those technologies that work well with your current system. But from what I see, sometimes the calf feeding, depending if you have an automatic feeder or not, and just some of the transition cow handling, again, depending on if it's a retrofit or where your transition cows are in, um, I think that sometimes that can be a little bit challenging. Uh, I know that there are, are some concerns with uh, research showing that colostrum management isn't what it should be across all robotic herds. So that leads me to think that there is some opportunity where maybe we're not putting the focus in some of the transition cows as well. And But again, th these are some scenarios. But I would say that from what I've seen, it's a lot of the, the calf feeding side of things that gets a little bit lost in the shuffle. Um, but then overlooking, I would say, you know, what are some with, with the heifers as well? And just going back to training and making sure that they're being taken care of and we're really watching how they're adapting and not getting lost in the shuffle. Okay, great. Um, another question, and I'm actually bringing two into one here, but um, what, word this way? what is the biggest mental or thought process change that producers have to make when then transitioning to robotic milking? Oh, that's a really excellent. Thought process-wise is that, so you can be looked at it as almost that you're more hands-off, but I think it's just that you're not more hands-off. You still need your eyes in the barn, but the transition now is that you're getting all this data, and if you're not used to making management decisions on you know, information or data management, that can be a little bit of an adjustment. But again, it's figuring out what are the routines that you want for your farm, and then let's filter this information we're getting from the robot so it can point out cows that either are struggling or those cows that you need to have bred. And again, I think that really the, the, the thought process-wise on that side is that you know now we're going to be sitting down at least twice, three times a day at a computer and looking at information to give certain, or bring certain cows to our attention. And are they the right, right cows that they, we want to see? And if not, what can we do to adjust that? But that all comes back with training, of course, and working with a um, competent dealership and staff and et cetera. And actually, this next question to that. Uh, you mentioned about training. How long should someone expect or how much training does it take to get up and running on a robotic system for the average producer? Ah, well, I can say that I've seen some farms where after a few weeks things are taking off and I've seen some where producers have told me that it took a year before they felt that things were really under control. But the initial training, I would say that animals in general, whether it's conventional or robotic systems, it takes about two weeks to learn. Uh, again, if the cow's healthy and taking off, that it normally will be 
the first week that, you know, just making sure she understands the layout of the system and is uh, coming through, that then it'll be just fine. But I would say the, the training, I mean, really, you know, there's the cow training side, but I would say in some ways it takes more of the, the people training side and, again, just a different way of looking at that data that is where it comes into. But with proper training and having everyone on board, you're in good standing. Okay. You talk quite a bit about uh, flow and traffic flow. Are there barn styles or barn layouts that are not ideal for uh, robotic milking systems? Well, I guess I'll turn that question around a little bit and saying that as long as we're meeting the cows or requirements as far as bunk space, water space, laying space, space in front of the robot, then it should be a good layout, but we just need to make sure that we're, you know, thinking about the cow. So I would say that you can't necessarily quite make that, I can't say that this layout works versus this layout because it all comes back to are we meeting those, you know, needs and requirements that the cow has in place to make her the most comfortable. Okay. And then this next question maybe has to do with space issues too or that, but it maybe is limited as well, is what is the optimal number of cows per robot uh, in layouts or systems? Uh, well, that kind of goes back to as well as how fast are your cows milking out. Um, that leads back to capacity because, again, when we're aiming for those three time a day cleaning at least and uh, the, some of the other idle time that we know we'll have, uh, it really does come back to what are the cows milking and how fast can we attach uh, and, you know, have proper stimulation of the animal to let down milk. So I see some farms where, I mean, really 50 is your max, but then other farms that can get closer to that 62 to 65 cows per robot. But there are a lot of factors that play in as well. Um, again, the consistency of the routine. So if your routines vary from day to day as far as feeding times, cleaning times, or et cetera, then you probably will be closer to that 50 cows per robot or 55 just because if they can't figure out what's going on, then it's it, this is everyone's frustrated at that point. But uh, really, I would say it, it just does definitely depend as far as what your cow's milking time is, uh, do they understand the system training routines? And so I have to always say that there's so many factors within each, within each of these questions, but that definitely plays into it. So, Okay, great. And that actually is all the questions that I have received. Let me just check email here. Yep, that's no more new ones in email. Um, so that is actually all the questions I have received. So unless anyone else pops in another question here, if people wanted to get more information or further questions on this, is there a best way to maybe reach out to you or reach out to the automatic milking system team at D Laval uh, well, or a process? I yeah, absolutely. I would really encourage that um, anyone to reach out to me at lizzie.french at dlaval.com. If you have any initial questions, and then if it's something that I can't answer, I'd be more than happy to put you in contact with someone that could help out. Okay, great. And I, for those of you who maybe missed that URL, I just posted it, or sorry, email address, I just posted it in the chat box as well, so you can just copy it from there as well, or feel free to reach out to us here at the Bullvine, uh, and we'd be more than happy to put you in contact uh, with the applicable people. Uh, we do appreciate everyone joining us today. We thank Lizzie for taking the time to uh, present in our webinar series. It was very informative, and I appreciate that. But thank you, everyone, and thanks for attending.